Welcome back to Repod, the University of Solvers research podcast. My name is Andy Meir, and I'm delighted to be back with another episode of one of our amazing researchers, this time from the School of Science, Engineering and Environment. And we're going to introduce Dr. Mark Hughes to the stream. Welcome, Mark. How are you? Hi, I'm good, Andy. How are you? Great, thanks. Well, it's great to be here. This is the first episode of the new year, which is wonderful, just as the trimester's getting oh, yeah. going. How are you doing? What's been happening with you? I'm, yeah, I'm good. I uh, just started teaching and um, carrying on my research. So um, I've got a really exciting research project going on at the moment that we can talk about. Fantastic. Um, and it's, yeah, we're back in the classrooms as well. We, I had my big first big lecture yesterday, which was wonderful. Students were really motivated. How's it? Yes. It's, it's great to be back on campus, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It feels really like it's getting back to normal now. So yeah, so, yeah fingers the, crossed. The classrooms are very much more normal than before. Yeah, it's been a very different couple of years. And I think uh, one of the big challenges has been to kind of keep the research going. How have you found it? Because it's been such a difficult thing to do. Uh, yeah, it was really difficult, especially over COVID, where we couldn't come in. And I'm, I'm an experimentalist, so I do experiments and um, couldn't come into the lab and do the experiments that I really wanted to do. Um, so a lot of it was looking back at data I already had and trying to trying to glean out some some new work from that and there was some success with that i did manage to to get out a couple of papers over the the covid lockdowns but um it's really good now to be back in the lab and i can actually get my hands on some equipment and get some some new data Definitely. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And yeah, I guess it goes back to sort of the origins of our research. And I suppose sometimes this moment for many people has been a chance to sort of reflect back and look at what they're doing and, and do things differently as well. And I know quite a few colleagues have, have really made use of the time to sort of think about where they're going with research, which I think is is often something that's easily lost sight of along the way. And, and maybe just sort of kick off the conversation to sort of tell us a little bit about where you began. I mean, maybe first of all, what do you teach? What's your sort of areas that you cover? Um, so I, I teach quite a lot. Like I, I teach uh, electricity, magnetism and light. Um, I used to teach second year uh, materials. Um, uh, I also teach third year photonics and nanotechnology. Um, I do uh, a fourth year labs on thin films. Um, I do uh, first year labs as well, which is kind of more general. So yeah, quite a variety of things. Yeah. Absolutely. And how did that all begin for you? So can you remember sort of the moment where you sort of thought a research career might be might be the path that you want to take? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. So um, I did my degree in electrical engineering at Warwick. Um, and I didn't really consider research as a career path. Um, like I, I wanted to get into engineering and like at the time, I was a little bit naive and the, I kept seeing in newspaper articles and stuff that you go into engineering and there's a shortage of engineers when they, they've got these big salaries. And I kind of thought after I graduate, I'll just walk into a, a proper engineering job um and it didn't work out like that and i i ended up working in in an office um and realized that's not what i wanted but it gave me the time to think about what do i actually want to do and um yeah i decided to to go for a phd after that so after working for a year 
in an office. I, I started my PhD at Southampton. It's, uh, it feels like such a common thing, that sort of period of time to be able to reflect and think about where you're going. I always tell my undergraduate students that considering a master's is such a useful thing because the people that I know that do it, that extra year of sort of reflecting on trying to think where you want to go with your life is, is really, really useful. And I think often with undergraduates, it's hard to get to that point by the end of the three years. So, so yeah, I can certainly identify with that. So you, so you went on to then start doing your PhD. And was that yeah. a project that sort of landed in your lap or how did you sort of arrive at, at the subject for your PhD? Yeah, it was, um, again, it's a kind of random thing. Cause I know I, I went there for an interview and the work that this was at the Opto Electronics Research Center, which is um, a research center at the University of South, Southampton. Um, it, was, it was set up by David Payne, who is the inventor of, of, of a device which kind of it's it's very important but it's it, it ends up that a lot of my research is actually based around it it's it's called the erbium doped fiber amplifier and <laughs> well um, that's going to need some explaining <laughs> so not not many people have heard of it but you know that the internet wouldn't work without it so okay. basically all internet traffic gets sent down optical fiber so this is this is strands of glass and the the minimum loss wavelength of light that goes down that optical fiber is uh, a specific wavelength 15 50 nanometers um, but even at that low loss after about 100 kilometers um, you the, the the light has almost disappeared so there's, there's almost no signal left um, and so what the the director of the optoelectronics research center figured out back in the 80s um, he found that this, this element called erbium gives off light uh, exactly the right wavelength that that you need to send down optical fiber so he um, figured out you could introduce a small amount of erbium into a length of fiber and then excite it with a laser and then when your your weak signal comes along it's almost died out it goes through this length of fiber that's got excited erbium ions in it so when when this signal photon goes past an excited erbium um, it causes stimulated emission, so electron relaxes back down and emits an almost identical photon. And then this carries on and cascades as you as you go down the length of fiber. And so you end up with um, a, a basically identical signal that went in, but much more powerful. And then this is just repeated over and over, um, over the length of the fiber. So um, whenever you're watching YouTube videos, it's only working because probably dozens of urban vote fiber amplifiers have amplified the signal from wherever it's coming like maybe in the states or something um so it was it was all based around the technology related to the urban dope fiber amplifier so i um looked at a lot of different project supervisors um and the one i ended up with was um a supervisor who was looking at um not the same type of glass that's in optical fiber. There's a special type of glass called uh, chalcogenide glasses. So these are, are glasses based on sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. Um, and this this supervisor who I actually ended up going with, um, he had he'd not invented, but he was like the main um, person who'd worked on a type of glass called gallium lanthanum sulfide. So it's, it's a kind of specialist glass, but it's, it's got very interesting and useful properties. So that's what I ended up working on throughout my PhD was that particular glass, gallium lanthanum sulfide. Well, it's really fascinating to hear about this. I think most people don't really know what these things are and how they work. So it's incredible to hear that that technology back from the 80s is still sort of critical today. And I suppose one of the things that I wonder about that is how, you know, what, what motivated you to then pursue it? Did you have a sense of this being really interesting research that mattered or did you, was it something else that, that sort of led you to think, yeah, I want to, I want to do this? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was really lucky because my, my supervisor, both both was willing and able to give me a lot of freedom in mm -hmm. in what I was doing. So um, I was able to go and make these glasses, basically put what I want in them. And so I was trying lots of different um, impurities that I could add to the glass. Um, and I stumbled across this one called Erbium. So um, 
sorry, vanadium. So there's a transition metal vanadium. Um, and this one glass, when I when I tried it and and looked at its photoluminescence, so the, the light it gives off when you shine light on it, I found it was giving off light at um, 1500 nanometers. So almost exactly the right wavelength that you need to send down optical fiber, but it was incredibly broad. So um, this is actually potentially really useful because um, optical fiber only uses quite a, a small proportion of the, the potential bandwidth of so the potential range of wavelengths that can go down there purely because the, the erbium doped fiber amplifier can can only amplify a relatively narrow range of wavelengths because the mm. the the light that comes off erbium is very narrow it covers a very narrow range of wavelengths whereas i found this glass that gave off light at the right wavelength but a very broad range of wavelengths so i spent most of my time in my phd looking at that particular glass that i stumbled across early on in my phd and did this to try and figure out you know exactly what type of vanadium is there in the glass now, people listening to this might imagine that your entire PhD was you sitting looking at glass. And I think one of the things that I've learned a lot over these years is actually that doing even that PhD level work is, is quite varied for many people. What was it like to do a PhD? What was the experience like for you? Did it sort of, um, and I think it's often a long journey for people, but was it, uh, how, how did it go for you? I I really liked it. I mean, <clears throat> when, when I was doing my undergraduate, I was, I was a little bit put off, like I... I didn't enjoy it that much. I, I did the work and did the revision, um, but then when I started my PhD, I, I thought this is this is brilliant. This is what I really like. This is what I really want to do. Um, and a lot of it was to do with the environment I was in. So the, my supervisor gave me the freedom to kind of look at what I wanted, and the the place I was doing the PhD in was really good because it was a lot of people who were working on not the same, but similar types of work. So if I had a problem, I could I could usually find somebody who who could help me at least to some extent with the problem I was working on. So it was like a really fertile um, ground for doing research in, in the Optical Electronics Research Center at Southampton. I think it's probably one of the most valuable things that you can get as a PhD student is that freedom to explore something and and dive deeply into a topic that you're fascinated by and and that you know I think that's how all PhDs should really be and it's a challenge because then you've also got the burden of that freedom and constraining everything and making sure it all stays on track but I guess at some point you got to the end of that and was it a kind of clear transition for you upon completion because I think often with PhDs it's you kind of get towards the end of your PhD you're even at submission stage and it's waiting for your exam. And then there's that gap in between. So tell us about that transition from PhD into postdoc for you. What was that like? Well, well actually just before I went into that transition, there, there was quite a major event happen. So um, about halfway or just over halfway through my PhD, there was there was a, a fire at the, the, at the Opto, Opto Electronics Research Center. So then their main building burned down. Oh, wow. Almost completely. So, um, I was right in the middle of, of doing some experiments on vanadium doped GLS at the time. In the building, really great data um, <laughs> in the lab, and it was it was so good that I wanted to. I I was working late on the Friday night, and then I I went in to go to go in on the the Saturday morning to finish it off, and then I got to within like half a mile, and all the roads were blocked off, and I could oh see like God. smoke billowing out in the distance and found out that the, the building was was on fire um my first thought was oh my god did i leave something oh, on in the lab that yeah. caused the fire yeah luckily it was and it was i'm pretty sure it, it was something else it was yeah. something else far away in a different part of the building i think that caused it um but yeah that was a a, a big change so i i had to basically change direction i, wow. I couldn't do those experiments anymore um but luckily um, uh, we worked with the, the physics department and the, the physics department had some facilities that we could use and they had um, a laser called a femtosecond laser so this generates really really short pulses of light mm -hmm. um, so a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds so to, to put that in, into um, 
a, a femtosecond compared to a second is shorter than a second is compared to the age of the universe. So <laughs> it's it's the the pulses you get from a femtosecond laser are the shortest anything produced by humans. Um, so you've got these incredibly short pulses, um, but the, this means that the um, intensities that you get at that pulse can be really, really high. Although the average power is, is quite low, so you can put your hand in the beam and, and it's fine, mm -hmm. I think. It didn't hurt anyway. Um, <laughs> but you, it, Don't it, try that at home anymore. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can modify materials in really interesting ways. So yeah. um, what we did, I, we um, focused the light inside the, the gallium lanthanum sulfide glass that I was working on. So this was just pure glass, not, not with any impurities in. Um, and then at the focus spot, um, it can modify the material in a special way, but, but not do anything above that until it gets to the focus spot. So it, it modified the material and it increased the refractive index. And then you can um, translate the glass through the, the focus spot. So you, inside the glass, you have a, a region of modified glass where you've increased the refractive index and, and that can guide light. And in theory, you, know, you could make three dimensional optical circuits inside the glass by translating the glass in the right way. So I ended up doing kind of my, my second half of my PhD thesis on, on that, the, the femtosecond laser written waveguides in these Chalcogenoi glasses. And I have to ask, because it's fascinating to hear this, how did you know or think to try pointing the laser into the glass and, and observe then that it modified it? Was that a sort of hunch or was there research that informed that um, approach to trying people, something out? Or people have done it before with different types of materials. Mm. Um, you could try it on the surface as well. Um, so people have used different lasers to focus on the surface of glasses, but... Um, I'd seen with, with different types of glasses, people had done this, these kind of buried waveguides where it's under the surface, but no one had done it in this particular glass before. So that's actually my most cited paper is the one wow. I did then on those femtosecond laser written waveguides in Chalcogenoi glass. Wow, that's an incredible journey to through the PhD, certainly un unusual and an incredible challenge as well. I think often we don't talk about those obstacles to completing research, which are many and varied, certainly. But a fire burning down your lab is, is an exceptional one for sure. <laughs> so then you completed the PhD and then where was it after that? What took you, what was your next chapter? Yeah, well, I once, once I was close to completing, completing my PhD, I, I knew I wanted to take the opportunity to go abroad um, because I realized that, that having a PhD allows you to, to go to the potential, potentially go to pretty much anywhere in the world because, you know, you're doing something quite specialist. So if a university, the other side of the world is, is looking at that, you, you're quite fairly likely to be able to get a job there doing that. Yeah. So I, I looked around and I applied for postdocs in uh, Florida, in Australia, and in Japan. Um, and the one um, in Japan came through. I, I got offered a position there. Um, and it was, actually, it was actually a year before I actually finished my PhD, I got offered the position. So wow. I, I knew where I was going to go before I finished my PhD. And, there's a bit of time pressure because the my supervisor there in, in Japan kept asking, when are you going to finish? When are you going to finish? <laughs> I I didn't want to leave it too long in case like they they couldn't hire me. So um so yeah, I, I managed to finish, I think, relatively quickly given the circumstances. It's, uh, it's a great, great way to do it, certainly to have a job lined up whilst you're still completing is, is wonderful motivation, as you say. And I think it's it's like you say, it does open up the world to you. I remember as a PhD student, one of my supervisors you know, just telling me that once you've got your PhD, the world just becomes this, this place that's available to you. And, and it certainly is. I think it's, it's certainly partly entering into that the international community of collaborators that share a common sort of knowledge of a subject. So. Japan sounds absolutely incredible. So you were there for quite, for quite a few years, and and what was that as a research? What was that like as a research environment? How was it different? What was it like to be researching in that in that context? Yeah, it was very different to working in the UK. 
Um, so there's there was good and bad points. So I mean, I, I went there. I didn't speak any Japanese. Just <laughs> just arrived there, and in this country that's on the other side of the world, very very strange. And um, you know, I felt it was for the first few months felt quite isolated because especially where I was, I was at a, a university called Toyota Technological Institute, which is uh, it's really quite a small private university that's set up by Toyota Motor Corporation. Um, and it's it's in the suburbs of Nagoya, which is a, a city in central Japan. And, you know, Japan is quite homogenous. It's mostly Japanese people, but um, in the center is not quite so. But where I was, it, it was all Japanese. There wasn't any non-Japanese people around that you'd go for months and months without seeing anyone who wasn't Japanese. Um, but I got used to that. Um, but yeah, as, as a place for doing research, it was actually really good because, because I couldn't do anything else. I could just focus on my research. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it sounds kind of boring, but um, I just had to focus on my research because there wasn't much else to do. But I I really liked it, and and plus, I could go go around Japan, um, even though I was kind of isolated and there wasn't that much to do. Just just going around Japan was really interesting, and and seeing Japanese people and the way Japan is is just so different to the UK that I was just always excited being there. Um, but it also meant I could. Um, really focus on my research and I, I got um, a lot done during my time in Japan. Um, yeah. so I managed to publish quite a lot of papers on a lot of diverse things while I was in Japan. I think certainly the the sort of international side of research is one of the really strong values of, and the virtues of, of the research community as well, being able to have those experiences. And you often hear of people doing exchanges with other people from other, uni other universities around the world, which I think is a fantastic opportunity to learn about how knowledge, how knowledge is different elsewhere as well, and how we think about knowledge differently in different parts of the world. So fast forward to where you are now. I mean, one of the things I always like to ask people is, how do you maintain sort of motivation for research? And I think you know, sort of alluded to it a little bit, but what keeps you going? Um, I don't know. I just love physics. There's there's <laughs> just so much to find out about it, and it's. Um, I, I know you might. Someone might say, "Oh, that a, a physicist would say that," but, but physics really underpins everything. So, you know chemistry all relies on physics Bio uh, biology all relies on chemi chemistry which relies on physics so at, at the the base of all understanding about nature is is physics so um it's always exciting there's always lots to find out so um yeah, and, and I'm, you I'm have your own sort of kind of key priorities right now what is it you're working on tell us a bit about research project that you mentioned earlier tell us what you're working on yeah so um for for quite a while now, when I've, I've worked in lots of done lots of different types of research, uh, I did this work on charcoal and eye glasses. I, I came back to the UK and I I worked on um, charcoal and eye glasses again, but looking at electronic devices. Um, I worked somewhere else in Japan where I was looking at carbon nanotube devices. Um, but when I was at Surrey, um, the University of Surrey, which is before I came to Salford, um, I was working on um, rare earth implanted silicon. So there are some projects there looking at, at, at rare earths, and they've got the, the main iron implantation facility at the University of Surrey. So that's where most of the, the research into iron implantation is done. And, and iron implantation is a really important technology because it's the technology that is used to introduce impurities in microchips. Mm. Um, and um, I was working on a project that was looking to introduce a class of elements called rare earths. Um, and these give off light at specific wavelengths. So, so like I said, the erbium in the erbium boat fiber amplifier is, is one of the rare earths and it, it gives off light at this special wavelength of 15, 15 nanometers. Um, if you implant it into silicon, 
it can still give off light at that wavelength. Um, it's a lot more difficult than when it's in glass. You have to do a lot to it to try and get the get the urban to give off light because because silicon doesn't like giving off light, but but you can do it. And most people have been looking at that as um, a photonic application. So looking at perhaps introducing um, optical fiber signals directly into microchips and using Erbium as a, an interface for that. Um, but I just had the idea that maybe this could be used for quantum technologies. So this was something that was pretty new at the time. Um, and people were, were wondering what sort of um, material systems could be used to, to build a quantum computer. And there are, there are many, many different ways that people have come up with for, for building quantum computers. And they're, they're still hotly investigated. But I've been pursuing erbium implanted silicon as a potential way of building quantum computers for quite some time now. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why specifically this material could be used um, in quantum computers and why it might be useful. So firstly, it's in silicon, right, which is really important because basically if you're going to build tiny circuits, you need to do it in silicon. The technology that's been built up over decades and decades to, to build the, the type of circuits that you find in microchips is is really quite incredible there's there's nothing in my opinion there's, there's nothing that that humans have done that that comes anywhere close to the the level of sophistication that you get in silicon microchip technology so um, if you're going to build a quantum computer we've got all this know-how but it's in it has to be in silicon because that's how we know to, how to build the tiny circuits um, if we use, look at the element erbium, so it, it has a particular atomic structure. It's it's electronic orbital. So if you if you remember that you can think of the periodic table, there's this this block floating outside, and and that is the, the rare earth and actinides, and that's because they they made the the uh, fill up the, the f orbital. Um, so, so all the transitions that occur, the optical transitions, and you can get magnetic transitions, this all occurs in, in the F orbital, but you've got um, orbitals that are already full that, that surround it. So you've got this atomic scale shield that, that goes around the rare earth elements, including erbium, um, and this shields them from the environment. And this is really important because one of the main things that you need to do when you're, you're building a quantum computer, so you base your quantum computer on, on qubits, so some individual quantum system. Um, and you want to shield it from the environment to stop um, what's called decoherence occurring. So, so decoherence is where um, something from the environment leaks in and interferes with the quantum state that you've set up on your qubit. So already Erbium itself is, is ideal in that respect. And it also then gives off light at 15, 50 nanometers, the exact wavelength that we need to send down optical fiber. So if you um, wanted to communicate between two quantum computers, for example, then really using the, the fiber optic network at, at 15, 50 nanometers is, is pretty much the only practical way of doing that. So Erbium could do that. And we were implanting it as well which is the technology that is used in silicon microchip fabrication. So there's a lot of reasons why this was important. So I, I've been pursuing this and um, doing lots of different experiments on erbium implanted silicon to, to try and see if it's actually could be used in, in quantum computers. It's uh, incredibly exciting to hear about this research. And I wonder how you connect all this kind of quite fundamental activity around trying to realize the design principles around a quantum computer with the eventual sort of applications. I mean, do you, do you think about those things? Do you think about what this could be used for? Is that something that's in your mind or is it, is it a bit more abstract for you? Yeah, so I've, 
I mean, I've been pursuing um, ovary implanted silicon because I, <clears throat> it's not just a gut feeling. It's I, I'm, there's a lot of good reasons why this could be useful mm. for a, a, a quantum computer. Um, and I've been thinking about, you know, what the actual applications might look like. Um, and there's something really exciting that's happened quite recently that's kind of changed my idea of of what the eventual application could be. So um, up until recently, I'd envisaged the the way Erbium could work in a quantum computer as as being, um, you know, you'd have some some tiny device that was um, patterned onto a, a silicon microchip. So so these types of devices. Um, uh, have already been looked at the work on a quantum level so that they're so small that um, they can they can pick up quantum effects and um, you know I was envisaging uh, trying to implant an, an individual erbium atom into one of these devices and then that the erbium atom would form the qubit and and if you can get erbium atoms close enough together they can they can couple together and, and be entangled um, so I was kind of envisaging something like that, where you've got um, individual atoms in in basically an electronic circuit. Um, it would need some magnetic field in there to to give you the the spin states that could potentially then interact with these electronic devices. But it's it would basically be an electronic circuit with some individual erbium atoms implanted in the right way. Um, but recently, um, there's a company called Psi Quantum who are looking to build a photonic quantum computer. So, like I was saying, there's a lot of different ways that people have been looking at for building quantum computers. And um, photonic quantum computers weren't, weren't really considered by the community as being that viable until quite recently. Um, so they've, they've been around for a long time, but you know the photonic quantum computers use photons of light as the qubits. So you've not it's not um, an, an atom that is forming the qubit. It's a photon that's flying around at the speed of light that is your qubit. So it it's very different in these respects to, to other types of quantum computers. But they, until recently, worked using uh, like fiber optic networks, so you could have um, some um, single photon source that would generate a single photon, send it down some optical fibers, it could go through a beam splitter, and you could have some phase shifting and then some single photon detectors, but you could have then a one or two qubit device that took up a whole table because it was just these these length of optical fiber and these these relatively large devices. And so people weren't really considering it as something viable for building a large scale quantum computer. Um, but this company, Psi Quantum, uh, they're basing their design on silicon photonics. So that's building optical circuits in silicon rather than using silica fiber waveguides. And, um, they're using the, the same wavelength of light that Erbium emits at. So they're using this 15, 50 nanometer light because silicon can transmit light at that wavelength as, as well as silica glass. And you can pattern uh, waveguides, so channels for light on, onto a silicon circuit. And again, you can do just have the same principles of the, the fiber optic network where you have a single photon source, uh, send it into a beam splitter, and then have a couple of channels with something to modulate the phase with in a, in a max endo interferometer. And if you if you scale that up enough, you can have quite a few qubits. But you kind of get to a limit still. Like um, the the size still gets relatively big on a, on a chip. So you could have maybe like 30, 40 qubits, um, and then it starts getting tricky. You start getting this big mess and tangle of of waveguides. Um, sending the light around. But but what this company, Psi Quantum, uh, have figured out is that you, you need to entangle these these states on the waveguide. So you, you set up a state with 
for your single photon sources. And um, these single photon sources then send individual photons down this network of um, wave guides. Um, and they're entangled using these, these beam splitters. Um, so you've got this, this set of entangled states. You've got this set of entangled states, um, and but it's it's limited. So um, what these guys at PsyQuantum have done is they've said, okay, we'll take an, an individual photon from one of these states that you set up and send it down a, a length of optical fiber. So that's quite creates a, a delay in there. So it takes time for the, the photon to go down that length of optical fiber, and then it will come back and interfere with the, the states that you've already set up. So you can entangle these states in time. You can keep repeating that, and, and they think they can build up to a, a million qubit quantum computer using this method. And so this sounds very much like the end points of this are remarkably more powerful computers that can do as yet perhaps unimagined things. Is that sort of how you connect it with the possibilities? Yeah, I mean, the possibilities for quantum computers are really exciting. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, I don't think most people would say they're more powerful. So um, quantum computers can potentially solve problems that classical computers can't. And mm. there's so many of these problems that, that people are starting to, to realize now. So right now, even though there isn't a practical quantum computer that's that's been built yet, people are, are looking at all the different problems that could potentially be solved by quantum computers once once they're built. What and, sort of thing? Give so us an idea about what sort of thing you think they could for. What are people excited about? Yeah, there's there's so many different things that, that you could these problems that, that you could solve. So there's there's problems in protein folding, it covers finance, AI, mm. everything where there's, um, you have a big parameter space of, of lots of things that need to be solved at once that a quantum mm. computer would be really good at, at solving that. I mean, it's just fascinating. I think I could talk to you all day about this subject because it's just mind blowing. And, and it's just so clear how much of an impact it will have on almost every aspect of our lives and uh, and yeah it's great to hear the journey as well into it so so yeah unfortunately we're out of time but mark i wish you a lot of luck with the research it's great to have you in our company at salford and uh, i look forward to seeing what comes next for you it's uh, it's an exciting time to be doing research i think and especially when you have people like yourselves that work across disciplines and are able just to make it so clear as to how important this is to develop. So thanks so much for being here and I look forward to seeing you around campus sometime. Yeah, thanks, it's great for talking to you. Take care, bye-bye. Cheers, bye.